it's recorded so people who could not join us can also still benefit from this conversation. So, um, David, who is David? I knew David recently by another Jesuit from California province where David is also uh, a, uh, 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 where David comes from. So I'd like to introduce you through Fordham University. Fordham University is the universe, is a Jesuit university in the middle of um, New York City. Their motto is New York is my campus, Fordham is my school. That's very uh, uh, inclusive and very encouraging. So from Beirut to New York today, we are meeting. Um, uh, Professor Marco, uh, as most of Jesuits, uh, has uh, received the trainings in philosophy, in theology, and did also an SCL in uh, psychology and religion then uh, proceeded with more trainings uh, uh, in psychology and her PhD, his PhD was on clinical psychology. Uh, what, I, what is very relevant and I'm very glad that um, I, uh, I met David because um, his uh, research interest was pretty much focused on well-being and well-being related to trauma. Uh, so if we read um, this research interest, I'm interested in the relationship between socialization and personality and factors that shape self-determination, especially for underprivileged groups in the context of personal and cultural trauma, substance abuse, HIV infection, and poverty. This includes the salience of the internalized sense of self for health-related behavior and the role of mindfulness in decreasing self-entrangement and facilitating post-traumatic integration of self-care, resilience, and compassion. And this is exactly what we are trying to do in Rise to Bloom, uh, trying to create this activity where uh, we can uh, promote self-care, resilience, compassion, and at the same time, uh, trying to cope with um, events that taking place in Lebanon, not the least the uh, uh, Beirut explosion in August 4th. Uh, David uh, teaches uh, these classes, introductory psychology, psychology of well-being, psychology of human values, personality assessment, and uh, guides many seminars on uh, uh, clinical theory and supervision uh, for uh, uh, for consultation. Uh, there are these publications, but also I would like to point out that uh, David is the director of clinical training. Uh, so, um, associate, associate director. I, I'm director. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, so I. This is just to point to you that, I mean, we are really glad to uh, be connected with this resource. And uh, um, as we try to do that, this conversation that tries to bloom over uh, supervise are gonna take uh, less than lecturing style, more uh, casual conversations. And where we're gonna discuss different topics. We have an outline of the con uh, conversations that we'd like to uh, engage in. But at the same time, um, we would like to open the floor uh, and give enough time for you who are present here to ask questions and to engage in Q&A uh, sessions. So um, um, feel free to raise your hands, write your questions, maybe in the chat, or try to follow on this and facilitate uh, while, uh, while uh, David is uh, presenting and talking. Okay, so we are dealing with uh, um, a traumatic event, maybe not affecting all of us as a trauma and not traumatizing to all of us, but still the event of, uh, you know, Beirut explosion uh, was very strong. We have also so many struggles in Lebanon regarding monetary, financially, uh, politically, um, we're struggling. And we are trying to find some sort of sanity within all this storm of uh, overwhelming storm of uh, crisis and challenges. Uh, I think Fordham University also went to, through some um, uh, traumatizing events um, like a suicide that uh, also urged 
for the university to, you know, act and intervene in some way to prevent further uh, suicides on campus. And uh, I leave it here to David to tell us more about this. How how did the well-being, how Fordham came uh, to be aware and um, to realize the importance of producing a program of well-being for the uh, students and maybe other than students. So would you like to share with us the stories? Hey, thank you, Fabi. Thank you for the invitation to be here today and thank you to everyone who is here. I look forward to our conversation uh, very much and to sharing with you what we have been working on here at Fordham to, uh, to find a way to respond to some of the um, really very strong levels of distress that American college students are experiencing right now. Um, so, so today uh, uh, we'll have a chance, I hope, not only to talk about uh, the well-being project that we're trying to put on its feet here, but the research and findings about well-being and what, what we have learned in terms of essential skills and how to build well-being. And then I'd also like to be able to talk a little bit about how um, putting together our story is a very essential part of constructing well-being and the program that we're in the process of developing together with Fadi at uh, University of San Joseph as well. So maybe just to begin with Fadi's question about uh, where this came from or how it all started. Uh, uh, as I mentioned to you in the United States, uh, we've had a tremendous increase in the level of distress in college students. So during emerging, the early parts of emerging adulthood, and uh, the numbers are really quite troubling. Uh, in recent surveys of college population here, as many as 62% of the students report being so depressed they can't function. 92% endorse things like overwhelmed to the point of not being able to function at all. Um, a very high percentage will talk about being anxious and then a certain percentage uh, will acknowledge suicidal ideation. Uh, emptiness, meaninglessness, confusion about who am I, a lack of meaning or purpose in their life, a sense of where they're going. So this distress is, um, you know, now well recognized on the part of all the universities in the United, United States. And there are several programs and attempts to begin um, addressing some of the suffering. Here at Fordham, all of this came to a real focus when one of our most uh, successful, positive, outgoing, uh, incredibly talented and pr promising graduate students um, committed suicide after she graduated from our program. She was um, a psychologist working in a clinic affiliated with a major hospital here in New York City and um, and ended up committing suicide. She, she left behind uh, her husband, two young children under the age of six, a grieving family. And at that funeral, the director of the counseling center here at Fordham and I had a conversation and decided we just had to do something to begin addressing this, this problem at, at Fordham. So um, we developed a, a course called The Psychology of Wellbeing, How to Live a Happy Life. And the course itself has been running for two years. And I'm happy to tell you that it fills up every session. Uh, students seem eager and interested because in this class, we talk about not only the challenges that are uh, you know, part of contemporary college life, but we talk about very practical well-being skills, how you can actually increase your sense of well-being and make yourself stronger, more resilient, more capable of dealing with the stresses that come about. So that's how this program developed here was because, um, you know, we only had uh, a couple of suicides here, but at another university, not far from here, nine students committed suicide this during the year when this, this happened. So um, we were, I think, driven as well by the sense of urgency from other colleges around the country. So, um, Maybe I, I can talk a little bit about the well being research and what we've learned and what we know and what we think um, uh, makes a difference. But before I do that, are there, are there any questions about how this arose here at Fordham? Mm -hmm. uh, David, so just uh, uh, to make sure there was 
one case that urged the uh, what, uh, there was only one case that took place on campus at Fordham University, or is it more than that? We I think we uh, had one one suicide that year, and we may have had a couple in the preceding years. But even uh, but at the same time, there was uh, you know it was well known that our students were struggling. They were emotionally challenged with depression and anxiety and that school was difficult in a lot of ways for them. Yeah. No, thank you. I want to highlight this thing because you know, we don't need to have a pandemic of suicides to be able to act. And sometimes it's important to catch the problem as soon as it emerges. Uh, and, and I would like also to say to tell to other people, if you'd like to ask your questions in a different language, either French or Arabic, I can translate. And if you want me also to translate, uh, to say briefly the ideas that David is sharing in another language, whether French or Arabic, uh, I can do this briefly without doing a translation of everything, but I can keep you posted. So, please feel free to do so. And if you want to ask him, David uh, understands a little bit French, so we can, he can practice a little bit more. Uh, I have a question. Fadal, sir, yeah. please. Yes, it's uh, Charles Chartouni from St. Joseph. Um, uh, Father, do you think, is it related to the breakdown of the community life, you know, which means, you know, there is no community life anymore because people are isolated and therefore they have had a hard time coping with the stresses of uh, the COVID, uh, you know, uh, environment? Uh, there is no question that social isolation is a major factor in the distress and the suffering. It's a major factor in uh, the anxiety and the depression. Yes, I think it is a very significant component. I think there are other things as well, but there's no question that the feeling of being alone or the feeling that no one can understand what I'm going through or the sense that no one else is going through this, I'm going through this alone, is uh, uh, a major factor in, in the distress and suffering of students. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, okay, great, Fadi. Thank you for translating. That's going to be very helpful. Um, so I'll, I'll pause periodically, or you can just interrupt me and, and uh, when it's a good time. Um, so what I want to talk about next are some basic insights about well-being that we discovered in the research. Our, our initial attempt to respond to this was to look for an outside company that could come in and help us conduct a program of some kind. But actually we weren't able to afford it. it, was just the costs were prohibitive. And so we decided to develop our own program in-house. And that's when we decided to develop a course in the psychology of well-being. So what did we learn when we looked at this research literature, which is now growing uh, dramatically? It's a very increasingly large literature. And much of it um, actually had its origin in a, um, development in psychology that took place at the end of the 1990s and into the 2000s. And that was a call to begin looking at something called positive psychology or how we can help people to build strengths and be their best self. There was, of course, until this point in the field of psychology, at any rate, uh, an emphasis on psychopathology, on how people are broken, how they're depressed or anxious or struggling with some mental or emotional challenge. And so the, the, uh, the emphasis was on how do we fix these things? And, and Dr. Martin Seligman was president of the American Psychological Association. And he uh, gave a speech in which he said, it's time for us to look at the other dimension, the other side of human suffering, not just how human beings suffer, but how they thrive, how they really make the best of their life and their world. So that was a, a very significant paradigm shift. And as that shift began to take hold, a lot of people started studying this and, and looking at ways that we could build strengths and capabilities. One of the first things we discovered was that there are two kinds of well being. Uh, one is connected, to, uh, we call hedonic well being, which is a form of well being that relieves immediate stress or discomfort. 
So for example, if we have a long day and we're, we're exhausted, we may want to take a walk or have a glass of wine with a friend or um, go out to dinner or go to a movie or do something that soothes the stress that we've been experiencing and relieves it. And of course, the advantage of this kind of a strategy for increasing well-being is that it is very effective and it, it does often, you know, address immediate stress in, in a very powerful way. Um, the challenge with it, however, is that its effect is temporary. And that as soon as, uh, as soon as it's over, we're still vulnerable to the, um, the consequences of more stress. And, um, and this form of coping can be quickly threatened by uh, changes in the environment. So for example, I may be wealthy today and able to afford a lot of pleasure that would increase my hedonic gratification. And tomorrow I may be poor or many of the sources for hedonic gratification could be taken away. Um, we saw that, I think, in the United States. Maybe you have seen in Lebanon as well with the closing of businesses and restaurants and the arts here in New York City. All of a sudden, people had, did not have access to these, these ways of gratifying the need for hedonic pleasure. So while hedonic pleasure is an important part of well-being, and we all need some level of this, relying on hedonic strategies alone um, is not sufficient to meet the challenges that we face every day. So, uh, and a second dimension of well being that uh, has been studied is uh, actually traces back to Aristotle called eudaimonic well being. And this is about being our best self. So, it's focusing on developing capabilities inside that enable us to meet challenges with a certain kind of equanimity and strength and capability. So for example, becoming more patient, becoming more kind, becoming more positive or open-minded. These qualities as we strengthen and develop them can actually increase our capacity for well-being because we have more strength, inner strength, that's stable and enduring and can be available to us at all times across all situations. So we can have good times and we can have bad times, but in both occasions, the inner strengths remain stable and help us to cope with the challenges of the situation. So the effect of this, of course, is long-term. It provides long-term strengthening of the person on the inside, and it's not threatened by changes in the environment because when we make a decision, for example, to be more patient, we can practice that in just almost any circumstance we find ourselves. So the, Insight from the research then at one point felt that really what you should do is build eudaimonic well being and focus there exclusively. But more contemporary research has shown us, I think, that there's a balance. We need a mixture of some hedonic well being and some eudaimonic well being. And when we blend those two things together, we get the strongest possible resilience and sense of well being that a person can, can create. So um, that was the first insight from the research, these two types of well-being, hedonic well-being and eudaimonic well-being, and the discovery that both of these strategies can be engaged intentionally with a plan on purpose. And that when we have a plan for gratifying these, uh, these needs that we're more successful in achieving the feeling of well-being. So Fadi, maybe I should stop yeah. right there and let you say something. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to translate in Arabic as much as I can. Uh, Mirna, uh, I'll call on you or also Fadi if you would like to say more things in French that may also people connect uh, with. بشكل بسيط اللي كان عم بيقوله ديفيد هو انه في في نوعين من الطرق يلي ممكن الانسان يعالج فيها مشاكل التروما مشاكل صدمات والمش بس الصدمات ال ال الكلينيكلي مصنفة كصدمات ولكن الصعوبات بالحياة القوية خلينا نقول أول واحدة هي إنه نسعى للمتعة الإنسان يضل ينبش على شيء يبسطه منروح على حفلات منسخر كتير م... ونحن اللبنانية كتير موجودة بسقفتنا بظن حيزا حدا من إلى أن إجت الأزمة الاقتصادية أنه منعرف كتير نعيش البسط وهودولي في كتير ريسورش 
نعم ما سمعت ما أو أم... أوكي ل... لكن في في البسط وال تعالوا هيدا شيء كثير مهم انه الستاريز الدراسات بتقول انه هيدا بيساعد مشكلته الاساسيه انه لما نطلع من وقت البسط من نرجع للاسئله الذاتيه والمشاكل النفسيه بترجع الطريقه الثانيه اللي ممكن ترجع لوقت ارسطو بي عند اليونانيه اللي هي انه الانسان يشتغل على بناء الشخصيه الذاتيه يلي هو الويلفير مش بس ينتظر على المتعه الخارجيه ولكن على بناء صحه ذاتيه وشخصيه ذاتيه تقدر تسعى تفكر تعمل خير لانه مثل ما بيعمل خير واحد بيقدر يبني نوع من من قوه وصلابه بالشخصيه اللي ممكن تساعد على المدى الابعد فحاليا الدراسات بتقول انه لازم يكون في نوع من التوازن بين الطريقتين مش بس الطريقه واحده من الاثنين يعني الانسان لازم يسعى على اوقات ينبسط فيها يفرح فيها بنفس الوقت يبني صلابه بالشخصيه والاثنين ممكن ينعملوا بطريقه مبرمجه يعني نحن نقصد نعمله فمشان هيك اجت الفكره انه فينا نعمل برامج تساعد الناس على انه يعملوا هيدا الشيء مش مش بس بيطلعوا القصص بطريقه طبيعيه. This is way uh, this way David I can say that we planned but unfortunately COVID did not allow us uh, to do for example some trips, hikes, things that people can enjoy with the first method. Uh, and uh, accompanied it also in rise to bloom with uh, other methods that are more pers- uh, that builds personality welfare well-being uh, in both of them and i would like to highlight here like since covid did not allow us to do these external activities to enjoy uh, some healthy uh, time uh, what we what we replaced it with is to have these podcasts that always conclude with a special humoristic Uh, sketch uh, done by Feder Aide. So if you follow really the podcasts that are uh, published every Thursday, uh, at the end of each sketch, there is of each episode, there is this sketch from Feder Aide that at least gives us some smile or some laugh. Excellent. Great. Um, so um, And do you, do you, do you want to, I think probably at this point, uh, David, would you like to tell us a little bit more on how these can be programmed? You mentioned that uh, whether the hedonic or eudaimonic uh, methods or approaches uh, are both need to be balanced and used. Um, would you like to go more yeah. in details, giving us a little bit yeah. like some examples how these can be programmed uh, uh, and not let our life run by us. So how can we do that? Yes, yes. Uh, I see that two hands up. Henri and Jad appear to have their hands raised. Maybe they have a question first. So uh, good. And then we have Sandra. Sandra Please. Yes, hello, good evening. My yes. question is for, for the for the well-being of what, when you said of being when we are nine, and we being patient and uh, all the, these um, uh, good things we try to change in ourselves in our uh, maybe behaviors is the well-being is it because the of the feedback of the others does it this is it comes from the feedback so, so let's say when we we hear other people say saying oh how nice you are oh they appreciate what we do this brings us this makes us uh, Uh, be more uh, uh, how we say in the well-being uh, part it means because of the feedback of the others is it is it from us or is it from others that uh, that we have this well-being? well thank you for asking this question it's so, so important because it brings something forward that that is essential to well-being and that is that um, I think the answer is partly yes uh, you know we Part of the well-being is the effect it has on other people around us. 
we don't exist alone, right? We always exist in a community with other people. And so when we make a change in ourselves, it obviously makes a change in who we are. It sort of affects us individually at one level, but nothing can happen in us without it affecting the people we live with as well. It, whether we become you know, more angry and miserable and negative, that affects the people around us. If we become more positive and hopeful, that affects people. So the feedback and the interaction is a part of the mechanism that increases the well-being. So I think it has these three dimensions. It increases well-being in us because we develop a strength. When other people see it, it elicits a more positive reaction from them. So inside themselves, they have their own reaction. And then there's the reaction between us that comes as a result of this dynamic unfolding in a new way. And so when you, when you have this now taking place in a community of people and you have a group or gathering and um, working on these things together, you can see the effect is it's dramatically increased. It's like a big set of dominoes, you know, everything gets affected by, by the change. Thank you, Henri. Um, uh, Jad, would you like please to also introduce yourself so David and even myself can know your background? I don't know everyone at the university yet. Hopefully one day I'll be able to. Jad? Yes, good evening. Uh, I am a Lebanese university student. I have a small question for Professor Marcotte. Um, I hear a lot around me, some uh, friends, uh, I hear from them that they went through um, periods where they thought they, they, they thought about uh, suiciding, but, we hear, but I, I heard that a lot from different people, but I heard it after they uh, surpassed this, uh, uh, this difficult period. So I want to know how can, how can I, uh, how can we let them, how can we push them uh, into saying that and uh, sharing it with, with their friends before it is too late, Yani. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, for, fortunately, they surpassed that, that uh, period. But mm -hmm. what if they didn't, they, they haven't surpassed it? It would have been too late. Yes. Thank you for this question. It's so important because if there are steps we can take ahead of time, uh, we can prevent people from reaching that level of distress and despair. And um, you, you may recall that there was some very interesting research done years ago on parenting. And one of the things they discovered is that parents who are uninvolved in their children's lives, um, uh, re the, the result of that is has a very negative impact. And so one of the positive features of good parenting is high involvement with the child's life. Involvement that's not overly intrusive, but supportive and present. And I think that idea is good for us just all the way across the lifespan. We need people to be involved in our lives and we need to be involved in other people's lives. And the more involved we are, the less the chance of the social isolation that can lead to the negative ruminative thoughts and the, the other kinds of, of cognitive beliefs that can uh, begin to drive the despair that leads to suicide. So the answer to your question is complex. There are many things that we would need to do to protect um, or to increase the protections uh, for someone becoming suicidal. Uh, and and for, for that, there are many um, suicide prevention organizations that are working very hard. So for example, suicide prevention hotlines provide a place for people who are in immediate distress, they can pick up the phone and call and talk to someone right away. And so one of the things we know is that the feeling of connection and a value within that social network is a very protective factor for or suicide. So that's one dimension of this that I think I would emphasize right now. Um, and, and I want to also say that it's so complex, there are other things that could be added as well. Thank you. And in fact, you are, you are very right when you say that uh, the family uh, atmosphere is uh, very important because all these people, my friends, they had one thing in common, which is um, parents that, uh, that 
trouble then that makes problem with the, with each other and with their child. So yeah. yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You know, I may I tell you just one quick story of a young fellow who wanted to commit suicide. And he was so distraught that he went to his father and he told his father what he wanted to do. You can imagine the reaction. His father was so overwhelmed, he burst into tears. And he said, how could you do this? And the young man was so taken aback by his father's reaction. He was overwhelmed by the suffering he saw it would have caused him. And in that moment, he said, I can never do this. So here, this uh, experience of connection with his father had a very, in his case, had a very powerful effect and dissolved the feelings that, of desire to do that. Thank you. Yeah, and it's uh, in Lebanon. It's uh, it's important to raise some awareness also for parents how to uh, receive uh, welcome support uh, a child who has suicidal thoughts. It's not evident. As a priest, I can tell you, I I did um, encounter this a lot, and unfortunately, didn't always go the same way uh, with this story, because some people think that this is a sin. And when um, some religious beliefs comes in, may make stuff more complicated, and uh, uh, we tend to blame as well. Anyway, there is a lot of work that needs to be done on this front. Uh, Sandra, and uh, then Fadi. Sandra, please introduce yourself. And uh, Hello, so uh, my name is Sandra Sassinian. I'm a second year pharmacy student at Saint Joseph University. And I was wondering, with all of this happening in the world, on the one hand, with the crisis, people dying, and on the other hand, we must study for exams, focus on our courses, and we feel like, as young people, we are losing our best years. Uh, plus, we are isolated, so we are alone with our thoughts. For example, with all of this happening, I started asking myself existential uh, questions and questioning my faith uh, as a result. So I was wondering what should we do in that case to, for example, reconnect with God and what kind of mindfulness technique should we adopt? Mm. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that question. It's really helpful. And it, it focuses on a very big challenge, which is how do we maintain a sense of energy when we're in, in the long haul of studies you know, Jesuits have a, a long period of training, and the young Jesuits complained about this at one time, too. You know that, uh, oh my goodness, uh, you know, three years of philosophy studies, and then three years of teaching, and then four years of theology, and we're going to be 800 years old before we ever get to work. <laughs> and so, <laughs> this is a, uh, it's a dilemma. And, um, and one of the, one of the answers that that, is, that was proposed for the young Jesuits was to try and find, see their study and their work now to see that the preparation they're engaging in is as meaningful and important as the work they will do. Because in the preparation, we have time to cultivate the inner depth and to read and to learn in a very broad way, as well as, as a deep way, the area of specialization that we embrace. And so these years of preparation, even though it can be difficult because we're not actively working with people, we in fact are engaged in a very important process of building a strength for the future faith. Uh, Ignatius Loyola himself was in his late forties before he was ordained to the priesthood. So he got a very late start in his ministry. And many people, uh, you know, actually are not unlike that. They may have a number of years in their early life where, for whatever reason, they don't engage in the work that will ultimately um, be the most meaningful contribution they make. So um, I don't know if this is a very good answer, but part of it has to do with trying to find something meaningful in the work we're doing today and connecting it to the future work that we will be able to do. Um, from a point of view of mindfulness, of course, uh, we really feel that the life and energy come when we're fully present to this moment and when we're not resisting or fighting against something. So it's the delusions of craving and aversion that cause the suffering. 
So the desire to be someplace other than where we are in this moment, that's what causes the misery. If we can pray for the desire to be here, where we are in this moment, uh, that can relieve a lot of suffering and give us the strength. Yeah, I don't know if that's a helpful answer or not. Um, sometimes, may I say one other thing? Sometimes um, if we think on about the people we are going to help, it revives our energy when we're, when we're working. Uh, studies are very long and very demanding. And if we have maybe a part-time engagement with the people that we, we plan to serve or help, maybe a weekend activity or something, that can, that can be helpful too. Okay, but I was wondering uh, how to not fear the future. So I'm kind of an, ex an anxious person. Ah. And uh, I was wondering with all of this happening, um, how to not fear the future because it's so uncertain. Uh, what if I'm not able to live uh, to help people, for example? Yes, yes. Well, I think the, the answer in mindfulness has been the most helpful to me. When, when I feel anxious about the future, if I can be here in this present moment, it's the greatest comfort. So if we are all right in this moment, uh, there's an old phrase, if you can be here now, you can be there then. So the idea is that preparing for the future really involves the capacity to be fully present to this moment right now. So when the fears come up, one of the things we can do is listen to the voice of the fear and we can counteract it with a more hopeful message. So as soon as we hear that fearful comment, we can cut it off and replace it with something more positive, more hopeful. Um, for example, uh, things change all the time. The future I see right now may never come to pass. And so that might be one way for us to relax more deeply into the current moment, the present moment, and trust the grace that is here right now. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, um, sure. Uh, also, Sandra, allow me here to tell you, I think what may certainly help is to be in uh, don't don't let the pandemic um, uh, push you into solitude, because despite the uh, safety measures, you can still be in touch with other people. And we are doing programs where you can still connect with other students. You can connect. Being here in this session is one of those things that can support your uh, uh, help you cope with your anxiety and build uh, hope. Hope comes from healthy relationships. So I just put on the chat, if you are interested in joining, for example, a book club where people meet to talk, to discuss, this is one way where you can connect, build healthy uh, social relationships, friendships uh, that can give you some safety. And you, you need to feel some safety somewhere. And sane and healthy relationships are those that can make us feel safe. And hopefully you can, um, you can join either the book club or we're going to talk at the end of this session also about our stories group where you can also share uh, your anxiety with people like Fenton. And we're going to move to this next step about what's the role of telling our story in helping us feel safe and sane. Uh, we're going to get back to this, Sandra. Fadi, uh, we'll take your questions and then we need to move to the next topic. Thank you. Uh, just two quick questions. Uh, you mentioned Martin Seligman, so I would like to know if your program is inspired by the Penn University, because they are very involved in the well-being and resilience. The second question, uh, are you, uh, beyond offering an individual or group uh, support, did you try in the university to develop like a mental health and well-being strategy where you can involve all the stakeholders in order to promote like an ecosystem of well-being? I would love to know about your experience on that level as well. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thanks. Thanks for your questions. Uh, the first one is, no, we're not officially or formally connected with the University of Pennsylvania. So uh, that uh, Dr. Seligman has his own lab there. And so that's actually a separate program all, all together. And then to answer your second question, yes, we're very concerned to develop a more of an ecosystem. So um, the well-being class is only one step 
The Counseling and Psychological Services Division provides a number of therapy groups, uh, provides workshops for students on various uh, strategies for well being. And then, of course, it provides a lot of individual psychotherapy to help students who are in, in various kinds of situations. Then the university itself, the deans have become aware of the urgency of this issue here. So they have tried to support various programs. Uh, we have now a comprehensive student well being program that we are developing at Fordham. And, uh, and it seems hopeful these things take time and they take money to build. So um, it's not happening quickly, but we are putting pieces together. And I think your, your insight about an ecosystem level strategy is really right on target. That's the most comprehensive and helpful response we could have. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, oh. um, could David, would you like to move probably, I think this was a good segue to start talking about what, I mean, that's, that's well-being. So how this narrative was, brought into the picture is, uh, was there anything that moved you? From? Sure, sure. Let's uh, talk about the, how we made the transition to this. Um, you know, uh, in addition to both strengthening hedonic and eudaimonic well-being, there was a very significant development in this work. A neuropsychologist named Richard Davidson was meeting with the Dalai Lama and a group of scientists. And you may know that the Dalai Lama has been very interested to know if they could find scientific support for elements of the Buddhist life and practice. And so the Dalai Lama has been very assertive about organizing these discussions with professionals around the world uh, who deal with um, uh, very serious research on, on these things. And so he had invited the neuroscientist, Dr. Richard Davidson from the University of Wisconsin at Madison to a conversation and in that meeting, the Dalai Lama said to him, well, you know, you're using fMRI and your other technologies to study anxiety and depression. Could you use it to study kindness and compassion as well? Well, that question really took uh, Dr. Davidson uh, by surprise, but it was a happy surprise. And what resulted from that conversation is that they flew several monks from the Dalai Lama's lab, uh, monastery over to Dr. Davidson's laboratory. And they, the monks very graciously volunteered to meditate and go through a series of experiments while they were being monitored by fMRI technology and, and other sorts of um, ways of, of looking at the effect of long-term meditation and cultivation of happiness and well-being. And from that research, they discovered an enormous amount, more than I can talk about in one setting. <laughs> Sorry, David, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes some accounts just uh, go oh. unmute. They unmute okay. themselves. <laughs> Sorry. No problem, no problem. So the four skills that emerged from this work, um, Dr. Davidson realized that there are actually four networks in the brain that are, uh, when strengthened, can increase well-being in a very significant way. So I'm just going to mention those four networks because they opened the door for the narrative approach. Uh, the, the first skill that they discovered was the capacity for attention. The ability to focus and hold our attention in a sustained way. And this, of course, enables us to pay attention to what's going on inside of us and around us, but it also cultivates a feeling of inner stillness. And typically, this is increased by meditation practice. There are other techniques as well, but strengthening attention is one, uh, one way to increase well being dramatically. A second technique was through positive outlook. One of the big findings from this research is that the brain is natively negative, and that has to do with the need to survive in the environment. We have to notice threats to our survival and be alert to them. And so over time and evolution, the brain has become very good at seeing what's negative and threatening. So to counteract that, Developing well-being requires 
cultivating a positive outlook. So seeing the positive side of a situation, even when it can be very dark. So the decision to look past what is negative. The third skill they discovered was actively cultivating a sense of resilience. So this is the capacity to endure stressful situations or to see difficult situations as opportunities where we can build a strength. So the question we might ask in a, in a challenging time would be, how can I grow in this situation? Or how can I leverage this situation for my benefit and the benefit of the people I live with? And the last skill they discovered was the importance of generosity, which is being both self-compassionate and compassionate for other people. So going the extra mile, but learning from our suffering, um, what it's like to go through a difficult time and then reaching out to help others uh, when they're going through the same thing. So these four basic skills, maintaining or focusing our attention, keeping a positive outlook, cultivating and building resilience, and being more generous, formed a backbone for the experience of well-being and strengthened four dedicated neural circuits in the brain at the same time. So from all of this work, another question began to emerge, which was, is there another way of strengthening the inner structure that has a long-term effect on building eudaimonic capability? And the answer to this uh, came in part from a book written by a man named Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. You may be familiar with this because uh, we always assign this book in college, so people are, are aware of it. But here's the story in case you don't know about this book. Viktor Frankl was a prisoner in the, in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. And as a prisoner, he noticed that some people in the prison were coping very poorly and suffering a great deal, but a second group seemed to be coping better and thriving despite the circumstances. He was curious, what, what's the difference here? And why is this second group so different? And what he learned from watching them is that the second group was telling themselves a different story. The first group was saying, they couldn't get past the question, why me? Why is this happening to me? Or how could this have happened? And a story in which there was no hope. The second group of people had been able to transform the question, why me, into what is this situation asking of me? So that was the crucial question. What is this situation asking me? And naturally, this is the question of generosity. And the answer they came up with was to care for those people around us, especially those who cannot stop asking the question, why me? And so they made it their business to reach out in care to the other people in the camp who appeared to be suffering more than they were. This second question actually generated a feeling of meaning and purpose for them in their lives in the concentration camp. Now, they had a reason to be hopeful and a reason to continue living so they could care for and comfort and encourage the other prisoners who were having a much more difficult time. So this increased the skills of attention and positive outlook and resilience and generosity. And that was another major chapter of learning in what is essential for well-being and happiness. So, Fadi, maybe I can stop there. Can you translate a little bit of that? Uh, yes, uh, I'm just trying to put the, what would this be in Arabic. Can you please just repeat the four uh, aspects that they... Uh, so there is a positive outlook, focus, generosity. Attention, the ability to focus our attention. Okay. Positive outlook, building resilience, and generosity. The neuroscience helped us to see that these four skills have a, a very central role in increasing well being or happiness. Yeah, exactly. So, Halwe uh, Osset Dalai Lama, Yale Nabba Davidson, researcher in psychology, Ala Anu Badalman, Bas Nidrus, 
شو اللي وضع الناس لما يكونوا ستريسد او ديبريسد وباحباط انه ندرس كمان الناس المبسوطين يعني شو اللي بتخلي الناس تكون مبسوطه يعني الدراسه تكون مش بس على الاسباب اللي بتودي للحالات السلبيه ولكن ندرس كمان الحالات الايجابيه وكيف بتنبنى وهون اكتشفوا انه في اربع عوامل بتساعد، اول وحده للناس يكونوا بحاله ايجابيه داخليه قادرين يتخبطوا مشاكلهم هي انه القدره على تركيز الانتباه، القدره على انه الواحد يخلي نوع من بوزيتيف اوتلوك كيف نترجمها يعني وضعيه ايجابيه للحياه، نقدر نشوف ايجابيات بالامور اللي عم نمرق فيها في الريزيلينس يلي هي الصمود وفي عندنا بعدين الجينيروزيتي انه الانسان يكون كريم كريم بمعنى انه يقدر ينتبه لغيره يتطلع بالمجتمع والوضع اللي حواليه مش ضل يفوكس على ذاته هلا الشيء الانترستنج انه كمان عملوا دراسات على مجموعتين انه ليش مجموعه قدرت تتخطى المشاكل مجموعه ثانيه ما قدرت تتخطى المشاكل هو انه اول مجموعه ضلت دائما بتقدر ضلت حاصره ذاتها وتفكيرها بسؤال ليش انا ليش هيك عم بيصير معي هالسؤال اللي ممكن يوصل ل شك بالذات وتخلي الانسان دائما بجو سلبي بين افكاره ومن حواليه، اما المجموعه الثانيه قدرت تنتقل تسأل ذاتها، الاشخاص قدروا يسالوا ذاتهم بدل ليش انا؟ يسالوا ذاتهم هيدا الوضع الجديد اللي صعب علي شو عم بيطلب مني يصير؟ شو عم بيطلب مني يكون؟ شو عم بيطلب مني اي انسان جديد لازم ابني انطلاقا لتتفاعل مع هالمجموعه الجديده ومعظم الاجوبه كانت يعني من بعد هذا السؤال كانت معظم هالاجوبه تجي باطار انه يعني الاشخاص يلاقوا الجواب على هذا السؤال انه تخليهم يصيروا اقرب من الناس المتالمين والمتالمين الاكثر منهم يعني صار تقريبا لما المجموعة قدرت تتخطى الألم لما اكتشفت أنه الألم تبعها عم بيخليها تتحسس مع ألم الآخرين ولما شافوا ألم الآخرين هيدا عطي وقوى الأربع نقاط يلي حكينا عنهم قبل يلي هي صاروا قدروا أكتر يركزوا انتباههم أكتر صاروا يقدروا ياخذوا وضع إيجابي أكتر بحياتهم وصاروا عندهم صمود أكتر وبنفس الوقت كرماء أكتر من ناحية انتباههم والتزامهم بالمجتمع اللي حواليهم. I think I took too long. If you have other questions, I think Sandra has other questions probably. Would you like, are you ready to take more questions, David? Right now? Yes, Sandra. Uh, yes, so I was wondering, do we have to believe that there's always a good end to things in order to resist uh, difficult times? Uh, so for example, the, the, exam, uh, the example about the concentration camp, the group had something to hold on to and what was it to stay positive like this and to resist this? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, very good. So, uh, yes, thank you for the question. And uh, I'm going to comment a bit more on this in a second. But what enabled these people to survive the camps was the sense of meaning and purpose that they created by reaching out to help the other people. So the, the, um, that's what enabled them to get through was an experience of meaning. So the course of an event may not end in a positive way. It may end in disaster. It may, as we saw in the concentration camps of Germany, for it, it ended in so many deaths and so enormous amount of suffering for people. But what enabled those who survived to get through uh, was this sense of purpose or meaning that they got from reaching out to care for other people. And I think that was a very important insight that Dr. Frankel uh, then and spent really the, mess, the rest of his life kind of building out and, and developing is that uh, one very, very powerful source of well-being comes from creating meaning. Meaning is something we construct, we don't discover it. And as we begin shaping and, dis and, and creating a meaningful response to things, that can engage and um, a deeper part of who we are. 
um, and enable us to arise to a challenge that we otherwise might not respond to. Um, the example, I guess here's an example, I don't know if this will help, but I don't know too many people who like waking up in the middle of the night to change a diaper, but because it's your small child who's crying or suffering, uh, there isn't a parent anywhere who wouldn't be eager to do that because it's so important to them and so meaningful. And so we readily do difficult things when they're meaningful to us, but it's very hard to do something if it's not meaningful. Okay, so the persons who uh, were asking, why me, why me, were the, the ones that didn't find a meaning to their situation? Yes, it seems they were the ones who had the hardest time, uh, you know, be, becoming aware of a, of a different way to respond. Okay, thank you. Yes. Well, let me, let me talk then a bit about how do we increase this sense of meaning or purpose, because uh, this is where the... Um, the whole business of our story begins to develop. So uh, the answer to this question, we think from contemporary research is that by connecting the experiences of our lives into a coherent narrative, in other words, by telling our story, we gain a tremendous advantage in well-being and building an inner strength. The unique advantage of telling our story is this, it takes into consideration, it takes into account all the factors that make us who we are. When we tell our story, we include everything. Then all the experiences that have happened to us in our historical self are accounted for. We also can account for what is developing as a result of what we have experienced. And I call that the emerging self. So we have at least two senses of ourself. One is historical, the experiences that we've been through, the actual high points or low points or turning points in our life. Some of these we were able to control, many of them we were not able to control. And then there's a second self, which is the person we become as a result of what we've experienced. And we have enormous control over the emergent self. We can make a decision to be a positive person, a negative person. We can make a decision to live a life of compassion or a life of selfish preoccupation. We can make a decision to live in fear or to live in trust. We can make a decision to be creative and bring something new into the world, or we can make a decision to sustain something that's already helpful and important. So the emergent self has a lot of what we call in psychology agency the ability to shape and give form to the next chapter. And so this narrative identity, the story we tell about who we are as a person and who we are becoming, this is the one place where we combine all the parts of ourselves into a coherent, comprehensive narrative or story. The other thing about this that we know is important is that the story, it's not, it's just one thing to write the story, but the story has to be told. It has to be told and witnessed and recognized by another person. So it's a combination of events, both the telling of the story and the witnessing of the story that are essential for well being and happiness. Now, in order to do that, we've developed a program which we're going to be launching very soon, we hope uh, with uh, together the University of San Joseph in Fordham called the Our Story Program. And this project began as a, um, a project of the Social Innovation Collaboratory at the Gabelli School of Business here at Fordham a number of years ago. Here's what happened. We organized students in an evening meeting and then one brave student got up in front of the group. There were, we usually had about a hundred students at the meeting and the speaker would tell the story about their life, but they would do it without censoring any of the details. So the student speaker was very direct and frank. Um, for, for example, some students talked about what it was like um, 
living with a parent or a sibling who was alcoholic or abusing substances. Another student talked about what it was like living through uh, his parents' divorce. Another student talked about um, failing a test. Another student talked about becoming the most important member of the basketball team and so on. Uh, the point is that they were honest and they didn't hide any part of the story. Well, you could hear a pin drop in the room because the other students in the group were quite moved to discover that here's someone just like them was going through experiences they were having uh, and finding a way to create a meaningful life uh, in the midst of it. So the Our Story program that we are about to launch will set up groups that will support students and others in the work of telling their story and having their story listened to and witnessed so that what they have been through and what they are becoming can be recognized by someone else. And in this process, they can create a sense of meaning or purpose for their life. Uh, so maybe, Fadi, I should stop there. I might have gone on too long uh, to give you a chance to translate and see if there are questions. Uh, yes, بصراحة ما بعرف إذا في حاجة لل للعربي أو لا إذا بتقولوا لي إنه ما في حاجة مش مشكلة بس إذا في حدا منكم بت في كنت تكتبوا لي تكست مسج إنه لا تنكمل uh, بيكون uh, uh, للعربي فينا نكمل فيها uh, هون في س في كذا ش في شغلتين أول شيء في قصة إنه كيف بنخلق المعنى لأنه uh, حكي ديفيد على الناس اللي عندهم معنى اللي ملاقيين المعنى بقلب حياتهم للقصص اللي عم بيعيشوها دايما بيقدروا يعملوا مجهود ويصمدوا اكثر بالصعوبات ف وكيف بنلاقي المعنى؟ طريقه من الطرق المعتمده الواحد يلاقي معنى لحياته هو بالحقيقه انه يكتبها يكتب عن كل قصه حياته عن كل شيء عم بيصير معه يربط الاحداث من بعضها الاحداث المنيحه الاحداث اللي مش منيحه يحكي عن مش بس الأحداث كيف صارت ولكن شو اللي عم بيصير معه أو معها ولكن كمان يكتب ويربط هالأحداث أي نوع من إنسان أو إنسانة عم عم تخلينا نصير والكتابة لأنه الكتابة بحد ذاتها بتتطلب إنه نكتب بطريقة شوي كوهيرنت متناسقة حتى ناسق اللي بيصير بالكتابة هو نفسه بيولد معنا يعني ناخد على عتقنا بفاعلية إنه نبني ونكتب قصتنا ونحن وعم نكتب قصتنا عم نخلق هالمعنى لحياتنا عم نقول شو هالأحداث القوية اللي بحياتنا عم تخلينا نصير هلأ تاني نقطة مهمة إنه ما بيكفي بس نكتب كتير مهم إنه كمان نخبر القصة لناس تانيين يعني كتير منيح نشوف إنه في اخرين um, validating kind of recognizing عم بيعترفوا بالالم اللي عم نفرق اللي عم نقطة فيه عم بيعترفوا بأهمية يلي المعنى يلي عم نبنيه بحياتنا وعم بيعترفوا بنفس الوقت uh, بالانسان الجديد اللي نحن عم نصيره فمجرد ما حكي ديفيد عن اشخاص حكيوا عن هال عن قصص بحياتهم بدون اي ممانع يعني بحريه وحكيوا كل الانواع اللي صار هو انه مجرد ما الناس كانت مصغيه 100 شخص كانوا موجودين بالقاعه هيدا عطي شجاعه للاشخاص وهيدا اللي حابين نبلشه بالجامعه عندنا على صعيد الطلاب وعلى صعيد الاساتذه كمان فرح نخلق مجموعات اربع اشخاص بكل مجموعه للاساتذه والموظفين وتكون بس فيها موظفين واساتذه ومجموعات ثانيه تكون بس فيها طلاب انه يجتمعوا مع بعض يخبروا هالقصص لبعض يكتبوها يلاقوا المعنى لحياتهم بالازمات اللي عاشوها وبالانسان الجديد اللي عم بيطلع وعم بينتج من خلال هالازمات فرح نعطيكم اكثر تفاصيل اول ما بنطلقها هلا حاليا نحن عم ناخذ الابروفل من الاثيكال كوميتي لنعمل هيك نشاط بالجامعة فان الله راد بابريل 18 بنسمع من الاثيكال كوميتي اند ذن بعدين فينا 
نعلن اكثر تفاصيل عنه I don't know if anyone has a question. I think, uh, Henry, you have a question. I want to emphasize, like uh, here probably you've also found another answer to your first question that was like the importance of the perspective of others, how others recognize us, how important it is for our healing. And this is a clear instance that it's not enough to write our story, but it's important to tell our stories to others and others recognize it uh, as meaningful. تفضل هنري وبعدين في عنا ميرنا. انا كمان. وشار، اوكي. Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but I will say it in French. Uh, okay. We 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 always hear uh, around us that il faut pas étaler son linge sale devant les autres. <laughs> uh, donc ça fait aussi uh, c'est à l'encontre, c'est le contraire de ce qu'on vient d'entendre. Bien que je sais que quand on raconte des choses, même intimes, sur nous, ça soulage beaucoup et, et ça, fait, ça, ça renforce le well-being, le bien-être de la personne. Donc, moi, je ne suis pas d'accord qu'il ne faut pas étaler son linge sale. Peut-être qu'il faut savoir à qui s'adresser, choisir des gens de confiance autour de soi pour, être, pour avoir de bons conseils. Mais je, je veux avoir votre avis là-dessus. Yeah, David, here is a, a very important point. In, in our Arabic culture, and probably not only Arabic culture, we have this um, mechanism of saving our face, always looking clean to people, uh, socially, uh, our social image to be always pure, well done, and sharing about these traumas uh, and these challenges, not necessarily traumas, uh, will definitely or in, in a way or another can show our negative side how we are weak how we can be monsters how we can be really uh, the bad side that we try to not so what how how can we cope with this and i think uh, how can we create a confidence and confidentiality in these groups to, uh, to promote that yes yes thank 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 you so much um, both Henri and, and Fadi for uh, explaining in, in English too. First, um, me, is that your question, Henry? <laughs> or did I create another question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's better than my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I think that we, we obviously respect the cultural value, you know, there's a reason for this practice in, in, a, in a culture. And, but how can we take care of our psychological need in the context of this culture. And I think one way to do this is by creating small groups that are very trustworthy. So in the Our Story program, we have four students and one facilitator, uh, no more than five people. And we did that on purpose because of this issue, because we know that there is some parts of our story that we don't want to have public and shouldn't necessarily have public. And, but we may need to tell that story in order to understand it for ourselves and not to feel alone in the experience. And so um, one, one of the effects of that is the discovery that other people have, uh, may have been going through the same thing. And so it can um, counteract the feelings of isolation and social disconnection. But, uh, we want to make sure the risk is taken in a reasonable way. So it's extremely important in the small group that people agree to keep confidential what is shared in the in the group. So we uh, we we instruct the students uh, before and after each session. Remember what is said in this room stays in this room, so that the privacy of the participants is protected. Mm -hmm. um, and this enables us then to do the work emotionally, uh, to be able to, to talk through the experience without the fear of losing face and the fear that other people would think poorly of us. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is why it's important to have these small groups. Uh, ممكن تكتبوا لنا على رايس وبلوم uh, في اوريدي مجموعات تحددت هلا ورح نعمل اكثر واكثر مجموعات وفينا نكمل يعني دائما نبني مجموعات صغيره uh, 
فيها ثقة وفيها أمان إنه الإنسان يشارك خبراته. رح نضمن كمان إنه الموظفين ما يكونوا مع موظفين تانيين عم يشتغلوا معهم، ما يكون في هال هالوقت إنه تلاقوا مثلا الدويان معكم أو تلاقوا الدويان للسكرتير معهم، يعني رح رح نعمل مجموعات الناس منا كونكتد مع بعض. وهون لمرة واحدة بحياتنا رح تفيدنا إنه جمع يسوع هيكي كل ديبارتمون شوي كان ما في كثير هالتواصل بين بين بعضنا البعض مينا عندي كويشن وما بعدين بناخذ سؤال شار اوكي اي ويل تراي تو اسك ماي كويشن ان انجلش اي ويل تراي تو اندرستاند سم تايمز بيبل كانوت تيل ذير ستوري My question is about people who cannot tell their stories. They are very anxious and they cannot tell their stories. And uh, research uh, in France, uh, some researchers show that these people have not a secure attachment. Uh, so uh, how can we work with them? Uh, do you establish a link between the first part of your intervention, I mean the four skills and the capacity to tell a story? Is there any link? Uh, if, we de- uh, if we try to develop these skills at school, the four, uh, can we help people after to tell their story if... Uh, I don't know if you understand. Yes, I did. Yes, yes. Uh, If I understand, the question is, how do we help people who feel hesitant about telling their story or are so anxious? So let me say first that as we strengthen those four basic skills, it increases the sense of Mm self-confidence. And as self-confidence increases, we feel better about telling our story. That's one, one dimension. But the other thing that helps us to soften and open our story is simply hearing other people. So in our program, in the instruction uh, before every session, we tell the participants, you don't have to say anything. You know, you'll have a turn, but when it comes time for your turn, if you don't feel safe or you don't feel like talking, all you say is, I have no requirement to tell the story. And sometimes a person needs to to be in the group for a few sessions in order to feel safe. And then it begins to feel safe to tell a little bit of the story, maybe not all of it, or a part of the story that they feel more confident about. And in time, the ability uh, to develop a more secure attachment with the people in the group then becomes stronger. And, And the more we feel safe, the easier it becomes to disclose who we really are. If, Fadi, maybe you want to translate that? Uh, I can translate it in French if you want. Sure, of course. <laughs> I'm Yalla, Mina. Thank you. Uh, say often, and I would say, feel free also, Mirna, to add what you would like to say as well. So, yes. build on David. No, okay. Uh, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que dans le cadre des groupes où chacun va raconter son histoire, on peut ne pas raconter son histoire si on sent qu'on n'est pas en mesure de la raconter. Et euh, donc, on n'est pas obligé de raconter son histoire, mais ce qui se produit dans le groupe, c'est peut-être un processus d'identification, c'est-à-dire quand on va entendre que les autres racontent leur histoire, on va peut-être petit à petit se sentir plus en confiance et être plus sécurisé et, et pouvoir s'exprimer dans le cadre du groupe. Euh, c'est ça. Et donc, le groupe serait quelque part en train de, euh, d'aider euh, les personnes fragiles à développer un attachement sécurisant. Parce que ce que les recherches ont montré, c'est que les personnes qui n'arrivent pas à s'exprimer n'ont pas bénéficié, quand, ils étaient, ou quand elles étaient enfants, d'un attachement sécurisant. 
Donc, c'est dans ce cadre-là qu'on peut dire que le groupe est thérapeutique aussi. Mm -hmm. Voilà, je crois que c'est ça. You should have started translating since the beginning. <laughs> Thank you, Mira, for this wonderful translation. Uh, je peux ajouter that. quelque chose, uh, Père Fadi? Bonsoir. Oui, Bonsoir. Yeah, uh, c'est très vrai ce que Dr. Ganaj vient de dire. En fait, c'est beaucoup plus facile de se confier à quelqu'un qu'on ne connaît pas, qui ne connaît pas uh, notre milieu, nos histoires au quotidien. C'est vraiment très facile de raconter nos propres histoires que de se confier à quelqu'un qu'on côtoie euh, tous les jours parce qu'on a peur aussi euh, d'un jugement de valeur en quelque sorte. Et euh, ce qui est beaucoup plus inquiétant parfois pour nous, c'est qu'il y a des personnes, on, on a peur des fois que les confidences euh, euh, qu'on fait à un certain moment puissent être divulguées dans un moment de colère par autrui. C'est ça le problème. Oui. Oui. David, did you get this in French? Did the Holy Spirit I, work? I, I bits and pieces, so I think you better translate for me in English to be safe. Uh, uh, there is... Um, so Naila brought that sometimes there is ease to talk about, uh, to open our hearts to someone we don't know, we do not encounter in our daily lives. And uh, there is always this fear that if we know people who are present in our lives, at uh, sometimes of anger, sometimes of lack of control of selves, they may use this information that we shared with them uh, and may uh, were supposed to be confidential. So how far we can trust the others. So the idea is, um, should we always avoid sharing confidentiality with people we know or not? And if there is a way to cope with this, especially in the context of our story where we are people who work together, certainly not necessarily in the same department, but still uh, in the same university or institution. So I think the, the, um, the degree of vulnerability or the amount of our story that we share has to depend on the level of trust in the group. And if the group is not safe, then we don't want to share uh, parts of our story. If the group is safe over time, then it becomes possible. So let me see if I can give you an example. When I was in the seminary, there were 400 students and that's a lot of people. You can't get close to 400 people. So we created a small group of seven And we met every morning and we prayed together. And then we talked about how is our life going for just a minute. It was really 15 minutes every morning. It wasn't a, a long thing. And we would say just a brief check in, you know, how are you doing? What's happening today? And so on. And then the next morning we met again. We met every day. Then during the vacation times, we went away together. And we would take vacations and we made retreats with one another. And so over time, a feeling of trust built up and became stable and secure. And we knew we could say anything in that group without being afraid that it would be talked about. So to build that trust takes time, but it can be built. And the alternative is that we never take a risk on disclosing who we are And if we do that, then we never discover really our deepest self because we can't know that without telling the story. So it's a dilemma, but it is possible to create a safe space over time with a specific group and, and the gradual, gradual unfolding and revelation. We don't talk about things on the first meeting. We, we let things build in time. Um, and here... I allow myself to say as well that I think sometimes we exaggerate the fear that some things that are too confidential, we want them to keep them confidential. Honestly, there is, I think there's nothing that cannot be repaired, even if at one instance with the risk might be very minimal of someone uh, not really breaching, uh, breaching this confidentiality. Or, Or, uh, sharing something that they were not supposed to share. Uh, 
uh, I'm at a point in my life where I don't fear that. And I think we can get to this confidence in ourselves that, uh, yeah, there's nothing, nothing to hide. I mean, nothing really that's obvious. Uh, it just requires some confidence building uh, in addition to trusting others. I don't want to take time from Charles and Yola who have questions. And we told uh, everyone that we're going to, we have one hour, 30 minutes, but we, I think, David, you have time to. I do, sure. Time. Yeah. Thank you. I can also stay with you until, uh, until uh, 9 p.m. Uh, so we can continue, but allow me just to tell you, those who would like to leave the conversation right now, please do take some time to fill the survey, the post survey that I just posted on the on the chat. I greatly appreciate that. And if all of you can do it, that would be great because this is how we learn. We need to learn. We are starting this in new things about tries to bloom, how to support, how to create an environment that can support everyone. And we cannot do it on our own. We need to learn from you to be able to fix uh, and uh, help things. So answering this survey can help us learn what we need to do uh, to create a better environment. So um, here I leave it to Charles, then Yola, yeah. then Irma. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is going to draw, you know, on a, on a five de decade experience in a wow. war torn country. Wow, very helpful. Uh, um, which means, you know, throughout the last five decades, that I've been going through as, you know, um, a politician mm -hmm. and as a scholar, uh, I've been confronted with one major question that has kept repeating over and over and over throughout the last five decades. Is there any hope for us staying in this country? Whether living, uh, you know, through this in Lebanon or confronted with these questions you know, when I go abroad and because I spent part of my time in the United States mm -hmm. and people would ask me, you know, the question, Charles, is there any chance for us to go back to this country? Is there any chance for this country to survive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my question in this respect is the following. Based on what you have said about building the inner capabilities that is so important, that is so crucial if we are to survive, if we are to cope with the situation of protracted conflicts, which likens the one that we are and we have experienced so far in our country. The question that is to, to be raised, how to learn to cope with a situation of hopelessness. We are confronted with what I call, you know, or with what, what, what you know, Carl Jaspers, uh, uh, said, uh, you know, a borderline situation, the, the Grenz situation, and, you know, when he spoke about the situation of death, of illness, of, uh, you know, a moral distress that has no end, it's a psychological distress that has no end, etc., etc. And therefore, what we are confronted with at this point of time in Lebanon is a typical concentration camp situation, truly. You know, and this is what makes, you know, people break under the pressure, thinking that there is no other solution but to move away, you know, get out from this environment. Because finding a solution in this environment has become something like a self-fulfilling prophecy, a wishful thinking, not more than this. So confronting reality is so important in order not to break down internally speaking. And that's what I've learned, you know, throughout the last five decades, you know, of experiencing this kind of helplessness, hopelessness, and illusions, because we have had so many illusions. Every single decade, we would say, okay, it's going to be over. Every single, you know, uh, um, event would, you know, trigger this hope, and then we are disappointed, and we go back into point zero. Uh, that's my, you know, uh, broader, you know, uh, uh, horizon that I wanted to talk about. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much. Obviously, this question is so 
profound and so deep and it touches on so many things and um, quick and superficial solutions are of no help to this kind of, of difficulty. So the thoughts that I have are these. One is uh, recognizing the reality that situations may indeed be quite hopeless is the starting point and accepting them as they are uh, may be part of what has to happen as a starting place. Um, then once we can do that, then we can only take the measures that are the best possible measures we can take. And so I think something that, I'm not sure if this is a helpful thought, but there is no one solution, but many things brought together may either lower the suffering or increase the chance of something emerging that has not yet been seen. So when people can work together as much as possible using more than one strategy, more than one response, perhaps that increases the chance of an emergent solution. But the other, the other thought I have is um, a reflection of Hannah Arendt when she was writing about the concentration camps later in her life and, uh, and talking about the, the reflective life and the life of the mind and the need to be constantly looking at our experience and asking ourselves, you know, what's the best we can do here? What, how can I be more capable, more competent? So the cultivation of a deeply reflective life, uh, the use of more than one, we repeat the instruction over and over again uh, to remind them <clears throat> they don't forget that it really is not okay to share anything outside of the group. So that's one protective step that we, we have put in place is the continual reminder and setting confidentiality as the norm. But another thing that can be done is that people control how much they disclose depending on the, the confidentiality of the bond they feel with the group. So uh, if the group feels safe and over time has proven trustworthy, then there's a basis for disclosing more sensitive information. But uh, people typically initially don't talk about very sensitive, highly personal things right off the bat because they don't know if the group is safe or not. And so the group has to develop a bond, a sense of connection uh, to one another in order for it to feel safe to discuss more sensitive issues like sexual orientation or you know, difficulties in the family or other kinds of problems that, that would be taboo within the culture. Um, then the, th the third thing is that I suppose there's always a dimension of risk, you know, in, in anything we do, we can never have 100% certainty. And so we try to create the highest level of certainty we can get, but then at some point we, we say, okay, I'm going to take a risk and, and, and um, tell the truth of, of my life in a certain way. <coughs> We know that that's psychologically very, very healing when we can do it. So I don't think it's appropriate to take a foolish risk and we do everything we can to secure the space so that the risks are protected. Um, and I, unless someone has a better proposal, like that's the, I think the best we can do at this stage. Fadi, maybe you, can you? Yola, can my phone hide that she or but for the notarjan? Non, non, euh, c'était clair, mais il n'a pas insisté sur le fait que même s'il n'y a pas un grand problème qui se pose, même pour les, petites, euh, pour les petits problèmes intimes, il peut y avoir des, des jugements. On a tendance à donner notre avis, à conseiller l'autre, euh, tu vois. Euh, et Donc, à si ce ceci s'est je... clarifié mmh. au début, pardon. Euh, ce qu'on ce qu'on est en train de faire maintenant avec ces petits groupes, c'est il y a toujours une une séance. La première séance, c'est une séance comment écouter. Euh, on essaye oui. de euh, de faire un training, you know, uh, act, uh, active listening and listening without passing judgment. And we 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 do this certainly uh, pour les facilitateurs, mais aussi les facilitateurs les transmettent pour le groupe. Et les animateurs, euh, 
c'est leur première responsabilité. En fait, ils n'ont aucune autre responsabilité que de faciliter et euh, aider chacun à faire cette, cette écoute sans jugement. Et c'est quelque chose qu'on qu arrive à le faire avec l'expérience, petit à petit. Et ce que David a dit, je crois que c'est intéressant. Donc, la, la confiance, un petit peu, euh, euh, ce qu'on dit, euh, dépend un peu, petit à petit, euh, on fait un test euh, de, de confiance et comment les autres sont. Donc, c'est petit à petit que cette confiance et cette... Euh, la parole euh, se déclenche. Normalement, ça ne se déclenche pas tout de suite, mais si on ne risque pas au début, on ne saurait jamais si les, les gens qui sont devant nous, euh, s'ils nous écoutent d'une manière sans jugement ou d'une manière plutôt euh, avec compassion. Donc, il, quoi que ce soit, on, 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 veut, on peut créer un environnement et les, faciles, les animateurs ont ce rôle-là spécifiquement d'aider à créer une ambiance d'écoute, mais euh, il faut oser risquer un petit peu, petit à petit, mmh, tout, bien, tout, tout, mais avec, avec un peu de sagesse euh, entre risque et créer un environnement qui est sain et so, uh, safe would be good. I think that je suis that. tout à fait d'accord, mais par expérience, je vous dis... Euh, on a tendance à donner notre avis, à conseiller l'autre. Oui. Si on n'est pas formé à écouter objectivement, on risque de faire beaucoup de dégâts. Tout Mais à... vous avez déjà dit que les gens sont formés, ce qui est déjà très bien. Merci. Oui, ça fait. So, uh, David, just we emphasize that we have a tendency in our Lebanese society, but not only Lebanese, I say sometimes even Americans, to problem solve. <laughs> like when we see a problem, our reaction is to solve it, to try to address it and uh, try to give advice to the person. And these, group, the, these groups, I just explained that their place is not to advise, is not to solve the problem, it's just to listen and recognize and um, recognize the meaning that the person is trying to construct by telling their stories. And this will happen. Uh, the, the main role of facilitators is actually to foster this uh, environment of uh, listening and uh, appreciating uh, the meaning that's being constructed without entering into problem solving. Uh, I pass the floor to Irma. And then I think Jad is requesting also the floor after Irma. Am I missing anyone? Uh, I think I did miss some, no. Uh, if I miss someone, please let me know. So Irma, and then yes. Vlad, and then Lilian. Yes, hello. Uh, my question is very simple. I would like, it addresses uh, your intervention, intervention, Professor. I'd like to make sure that I understood the links in your intervention. Uh, starting when we started uh, about when they examined the monks and when they saw that uh, the meditation, the long-term meditation was uh, was uh, giving these four strengths, the attention, positive outlook, resilience, etc. Uh, this is it, I guess I understood this well, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And then maybe you said something about how to get to these four or maybe more than four strength points with other ways than the meditation that I get this right. I just want to know. And maybe one of these is telling our stories. Is this uh, the, the, the logical, uh, the logical uh, process that, that was in your intervention? If this is the case, how does telling our story, first question, how does telling our story bring us to these four strengths that we can get through meditation? My second question is, uh, uh, it, it um, appears to me that you were saying something like, one of the techniques is telling our stories. Is there something else than telling our stories that could bring us to these four points that we would have with a lifelong meditation? Thank you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Thank you for your question, Emma. Um, so let me say that the cultivating the four strengths and telling our story are strategies for increasing well-being. Uh, when we cultivate the four strengths, it increases self-confidence. And the increase in self-confidence can help us in telling our story, which then can help us to increase well-being. 
or we can just increase well-being by telling the story to another person. It's a different dimension of well-being, you might say. Um, so what they found with the monks is that the process of meditation actually changed the brain physically, neurologically, so that it was wired differently. And the process of communication between the neurons was different for these people. Long-term meditation imparts a sense of well-being that can't be achieved any other way. It can only be achieved through meditation. But developing uh, some of these uh, other capabilities, uh, like for example, the resilience or the positive outlook or the generosity, uh, even though those are all helped by the meditation, they can be pursued without Uh, can you, is it me? Can you still hear me? Great. So, so maybe just to summarize what I was just saying, um, meditation, uh, leads to a certain kind of well-being that can only be achieved through meditation. But telling our story adds to this well-being and achieves yet another form of well-being uh, that is important. So I think Jad was the next to ask a question. I see his hand. Yes, um, I wanted to ask... Uh, uh, per Fadi, about the groups that he talked about, how can someone join them? And I had another question, uh, the, the meeting, the Zoom meeting, where can we find its recording? And I want also to add um, uh, a small comment um, about, about uh, the facility, I mean, how to say it, uh, why people can't, why people in Lebanon cannot uh, say their uh, what what they have inside very easily because the Lebanese society, uh, especially no all of its uh, all of its categories, they are very uh, we are very judgmental. Mm. So um, we are very judgmental, and the more the person the, the person is perfect, the more the, this person is respected. So everyone tries to be as to have as a perfect image as possible, even if in the inside, uh, this image does not reflect the inside at all, it does not reflect what the person is at all, but they try to, to uh, do a lot of retouche for their images in order to appear more perfect and be more respected. Mm -hmm. This is the, the um, how to say it, the ma'yar in Arabic. Uh, the norm the norm yani. you must be perfect to be respected or else you are not respected yeah this is a good question uh, yes so well just to respond to that part of the question one of the goals of the group is to discover that we can be respected even in our imperfections when all of a sudden we have a place where we can be ourselves the way we really are a whole new level of self-understanding opens up a whole new level of self-compassion develops. And we, are, we can be more at peace with ourselves in a way that we can't be if we don't have that. And so one of the goals of the group is to create a space where it does in fact become safe enough to tell the truth. Uh, we found the students who were able to get up in front of the large group and talk about these matters without censoring anything gained a, a strength from that. Uh, that they became freer and they became happier as a result of telling their story openly, uh, even though it can be a little frightening. Um, if you allow me here to say something, I think uh, the difference, David, between the American society and the Lebanese one is that the Lebanese society is really, truly small. Like the entire Lebanon is half of, the, of Los Angeles. <laughs> in terms of population. So yes. 
um, it's more connected and it may create some sort of this I can feel with this concern but here yes. is what I can say my friends we have to try it and we have to create an mm -hmm. alternative culture where we see the importance and this can also give us hope. We cannot just continue with the cultures that exist. We have to make the effort to create a new culture that can support Lebanon more on a political level, on a spiritual level, on a social level, on all these levels, even at this therapeutic level. Um, and, and this is what we try to do. So those who are brave enough, I would ask them to start and create this culture and those who are not willing to risk it at the beginning, they can watch, observe, see if these groups work, if they don't create extra problems. And then bit by bit with time, you probably we can gain confidence and see if we succeed to create these cultures. But I do truly understand that our Lebanese cultures do not help with this. But that doesn't mean we should succumb to what we have. We have to create a new cultures that support us. And this is an opportunity for us. So, and it depends on you, those who are participating. I create the, the opportunities and it's on us to really see why it's important to create this new culture and stick to it. A culture of confidence, a culture where we can create safety so everyone can be who they are, what they want to be without being judged. And I hope we really, truly succeed I mean, with all those who will participate. Uh, Jad, and I think there was Lilian who raised her hand. Uh, Lilian, I think we missed her. Probably she dropped. Irma, you got oh, disconnected. Actually, oh, no, you're here, Lilian. Please. Um, no, um, Jad already asked my question, so thank you. OK. okay. Do you do you find the answer convincing or uh, compelling? Uh, yes, actually, but I would like to add something. Um, just um, for the groups you're talking about, uh, I would like to know like how we can like uh, participate in this or something. Yeah. So the easiest way is uh, the best way is. Uh, uh, Beirut. So uh, first, you can. I just posted the web uh, the web page of Rise to Bloom. Uh, the link to the web page. You will find all the activities around there, and I will write also the email Rise to Bloom at usj.edu.lb. Uh, Rise to Bloom. So this is the email. If you would like to participate in any group, please send us an email and we'll connect with you. Uh, we are very prompt in responding to, to people. So you can write us to rise to bloom at usg.edu.lb. If you want the recording, you will certainly find it on our webpage, usj.edu.lb slash rise to bloom. Uh, and you will find the podcast there. You will find all other sorts of activities there and how to register in each activity. Uh, if the registration is still open. Thank you so much. You can write de nouveau le mail, s'il vous plaît. C'est uh, ah, uh, c'est rise to bloom at usg.edu.lb. Uh, I will write it again. Ça va maintenant? Vous l'avez trouvé dans le dans le chat? Voilà, Rita, you. Is it enough to get the broad, uh, I mean, the podcast with this? Uh, what What do you mean? I so, mean, if you want to get the podcast, oh, how yes, do we yes. get it? You get it from, you can go to the Rise to Bloom webpage and scroll down and you will see podcast. Okay. Uh, okay. We are at number seven of our podcast, so you can. Okay. You can, can, can we share it? Can we share it? Absolutely. It's on Facebook as well. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's on uh, Anrami, the podcast. You can okay. find it. If you, the title of the podcast is Beirut Tahki Min Al USG. Okay. If you type Beirut Tahki Min Al USG, you can also get the, the podcast. Um, some of them deal with trauma. The first one was Mirna. The other one was parental burnout. 
The third one was on uh, dialogue between uh, religions. Uh, uh, the third, the fourth one was on uh, the resilience of people who worked in the IT department during the uh, Corona and Beirut blast, what they did, how they make resilience. Uh, and the fifth one was on USG en mission. And there is one coming out about how politics actually are helping or not helping students to find hope. So uh, this is straight to your point, Charles. This is why we could not okay. but talk about include politics when we talk about hope, because the main the serious problematic situation and the challenge in our country is politics that are not helping us as a community, as a group of people, as citizens, to bring sustainable hope. So we had to talk about it, but we didn't solve it. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anyone else who have more questions or I'm not sure if David, you have still more time. It's already 10, 9 p.m. in Lebanon. Um, or maybe we should uh, close at this, uh, at this, at this point. En tant que Libanais, on doit apprendre à être plus authentique et arrêter d'essayer pour tous les moyens d'être ce que l'on n'est pas. J'espère que la, la, la pandémie euh, euh, nous apprend cela. La pandémie et cette crise économique aussi, qui ne nous permet plus euh, de se vanter de ce que on n'a pas et on n'est pas. De ce que nous ne sommes pas. <rire> je voudrais juste dire que oui. je m'excuse parce que je n'étais pas là quand... I, I did, I'm sorry, I was disconnected right after my question, so I didn't hear the answer, but it's okay. I'll see it in the recording and thank you anyway for answering. I will find it in the recording. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for that. Okay, I think we can um, we can just Perfetti. call it an end. Yes, Jad. Um, just an out of context question. Um, I recently participated in the inspirational speech competition of oh. uh, from the USG, and uh, I I haven't received uh, uh, an answer about when the when, when the when they will say who won. And uh, we will announce the speech competition. Uh, we're still discussing the date. So now we are uh, sorting out and assessing each one. Uh, the results should come out on Monday, tomorrow. And we are planning on April 19th to have the announcement of. Okay. Uh, and, do and there will be a ceremony where at least the top five speeches would uh, would be read and explained, but we're not sure about the date yet. So you will oh, receive okay. you will receive an email from an email on my USG email. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and the the winners can read their own speeches, right? I would hope so. So we'll see. I would really love to. You Just would love to read much. your own. Okay, thank you. Noted. Noted. <laughs> noted. Judge. Thank you. So I think you are making us, uh, I'm looking forward. I don't know. I'm assessing speeches without knowing who wrote them. So the assessment is, uh, we don't objective. have authors. So yes. It's very objective and uh, hidden, blinded, uh, blind uh, assessment. So I look forward to see which one is yours and all the best with these ones. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Uh, great thanks to you, David, for making time, for preparing, for also uh, getting into uh, this trouble connecting with another university uh, overseas with long distances. Uh, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, and I promise everyone you will see and probably encounter David uh, more often because there is this project that we are collaborating between students at Fordham and students at USJ. Uh, and at USJ, we are also offering the Our Story groups uh, for uh, employees and staff and faculty, professors. Uh, that's not the case yet at Fordham. Probably you would learn from us, David, about it. <laughs> uh, so we will, uh, we will do that. And uh, I really, uh, it's been very fruitful collaboration, uh, getting to know you and working together. So um, thank you so much for the time, for the richness that you are giving us. And thank you everyone for participating in this um, very, and making this uh, conversation uh, very enriching. Let's keep it up uh, and keep sending us um, ideas,
plans, projects, anything that comes out, how to make this a new culture, a fruitful, productive, and safe for everyone. The link for the evaluation, please, because I lost it with my connection. <laughs> okay, I'll send it again. Uh, and I'll keep a little bit because I think, uh, yep. So I will send it soon. If Thank someone you. has access to Waze, uh, could you please repost it? Because it's apparently my laptop is rebooting. <laughs> and But okay, here we go. I'm almost there. Thank you, and please do fill the post survey. Thank you, David. Thank uh, you. Do you have any final words to say? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Post survey. Thank you. Uh, and sharing the link right now. My laptop is becoming very slow. Ah. Uh, oh, here you go. Uh, I think someone has already the post survey. Yes, I see it in the. It's in the chat yeah. there. Thank you, Rita, for sending it again. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Just in case, this is the post survey link. Thank you so much, David. Really much appreciated. I unfortunately I have to jump into my other meeting for the podcast. <laughs> Uh, yes. But we continue this conversation. Looking forward to hearing from the IRB at USJ, and uh, yes. then we will start. Good. Yes, we'll follow up. I look forward to it. Thank, thank you so much, Fadi. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Great to as well.